Every single thing you run on Maldi, you're going to really want to optimize your spotting conditions and your concentration and then lock it in. And the good thing about Maldi is everything takes about, it takes about half a microliter of sample and you have a 384 plate. I think we charge an app by the hour. So you really can, if you wanted to optimize conditions and optimize an experiment, this is a great way to get a lot of data really quick and optimize things. So the only thing you need to do, so right now we have DHB matrix, we have CHC matrix, and we have cinepinic acid matrix. They get sometimes kind of junky because these are our open access matrices that everybody uses. So if it looks like it's giving you like a lot of problems, then uh, I can make up some fresh stuff, but we run an open access facility. So mm -hmm. people come and use stuff all the time. Um, and you only need a half a microliter of matrix. So it's kind of silly for everyone to make up their own matrix to go through matrix really quickly. Uh, so DHB is the matrix for small peptides. I even use it for drugs sometimes. So it has matrix clusters. The thing you're trying to avoid when you use when you're picking your matrix, is one, the energy that it can transfer. Uh, and so the higher energy matrices are like the cinepinic acid and CHC, which are what's used for proteins. Um, and the DHB is uh, a little bit lower energy, so you need more laser power, um, but it's a lot cleaner on the low end, so you don't have matrix clusters. So DHB's got matrix clusters around 500 up to about 700 molecular weight. So if you go below 700, you're gonna have to spot a blank so you can see your peak come up within the matrix clusters because you're still ionizing matrix, right? So you're gonna see up there. Mm -hmm. CHCA's got clusters up to about 1,000 and cinepinic acid has clusters up to about 2,000. So I usually recommend people use DHB from about 700 to about 5,000 molecular weight. CHCA takes over from about 2,000 to about 20,000-ish. I would try, if you have proteins in the 20,000 range, try both CHCA and cinepinic acid. Mm -hmm. Cinepinic acid is usually for proteins, intact proteins. Uh, uh, I like to spot half a microliter spots because they dry faster. Uh, you, the plates, these plates are coated so they can hold a microliter uh, if you wanted to. So uh, the most important thing is one microliter of matrix, or half a microliter matrix, it doesn't really matter. It's just gotta be one to one. And then a half a microliter of your sample into the wet matrix. The order is important. Okay? So you want to make sure you add the sample to the matrix because it's such a low concentration protein sample that if you don't do that, there's enough hydroxyls and things on the surface of the metal to bind your protein and it won't crystallize inside the matrix. It's very important that it gets crystallized in the matrix itself. So when you ionize it, it can actually get out. Um, so, and then the other thing is differential drying. Let's say you had like 10 samples in a row you wanted to spot. Don't spot all 10 spots of matrix and then go back and add your sample to it. They'll be dry because there's 50% of C to nitrile in the matrix. Mm -hmm. And they'll be not just dry, but preferentially dried differently, right? So you don't want differential drying because the drying and how the matrix crystallizes with your sample in it, it changes the results. Mm -hmm. So try to keep things very like, uniform. I'll try to do maybe five spots in a row. If they ever look like you're getting differential drying, you can always use a solution of 50-50, 0.1% TFA and acetonitrile, the same solution the matrix is dissolved in, and just recrystallize your spot. And that will get them all to redry back exactly how they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's all you do. Always forget where I spot it. It's a 384 plate. You're never gonna find it inside the instrument. It's just a tiny zoomed in uh, camera. Mm -hmm. So write down where you put it. Um, and yeah, spot it. The, the, um, these types of targets, actually have a, a coating around the edge of the circle to, so you could load larger volumes without them spilling over the edges, essentially. And yeah. put up inside the solution, otherwise pressure won't give you a droplet, mm -hmm. and then this is to kick it out all the way, but you don't want to kick the droplet out all the way like that. You want to make sure that when you eject the droplet, you basically just do a, the, the light one, and the droplet will actually hang off the end of the pipe pet tip, and you want to touch it off, just uh, touch off the droplet. Okay. And then I like to even brace my finger um, with the tip like that, Otherwise, you can just be, you know, you're wobbling all over the place. It, right. it takes some practice. So, okay. go ahead. All right, so that's half a microliter. And it stays within the circle. And there's a grid. So you have to be sure you know where you are in the grid. All right, it looks pretty, huh? Mm-hmm. Then you're adding the sample with proteins in it. I see. Okay, cool.
left side with the bottom corner that's nipped out there in the bottom left flush against the pins. You can see that's the right orientation, wrong side, so it'll give you a reminder. Make sure that it's on the target on the holder. Make sure that it is not upside down. Make sure that it's not backwards. All of those things will cause the robot to drop the plate inside the instrument in serious pain. The control software. Below the plate, you just hit load plate, and it's the load plate button. Where are you? I'm in the Top Top Series Explorer, okay. which can also be opened from here, but it's usually open because everyone's running this instrument. Uh, and then you want to hit this load plate button. And then any plate's fine because they're all the 384 Optima plates. I usually just choose the first one. It's select. It says the hilarious thing of make sure your hands are clear. And then you hit load. Do not get, get sucked into a negative nine vacuum chamber, apparently. They don't want you to. Um, and so then it will, this is why it's nice to dry the plate, because then it doesn't have to sit in the antechamber so long. So it's not going to let it come out of this lock until it's in pressure. So it's going to pull it into this first lock. Okay, so it's pulling a vacuum now? Pulling a vacuum on the lock, then it will open the transfer door, and you'll see the robot arms come in and pull it into the stage, to the inner source. There's two vacuums. There's the source vacuum, which is about, I don't know, I can look it up. It's like negative eight tor or so. And then there's uh, the analyzer vacuum, which is the vacuum that the top is at, and that's about negative nine. So there'd be two separate turbos for it. Yeah. Uh, and so we make sure we maintain really good rough pumps. Um, yep. And we uh, make sure we change the oil frequently on the roughing pumps so that the turbos uh, don't have any air resistance um, in their spin. So we go over, so here's the position. You can, you guys are in what, D6? You can just come up with it on your own, you know, it's the alphabet and the location. Uh, or you can click on the position on here. Uh, both are fine to move around the plate. You can see the camera there moving oh, there around the is. plate, right? So you can see that. Um, you can uh, turn up the brightness, the light intensity in there, but that just helps you with visualization. It really doesn't matter. Uh, this is what changes the laser power here. Um, I recommend for DHB, a starting laser power in reflectron mode, start around 4,800 laser power, 4,900 laser power, you know? You can always work your way up. I've seen people go up to about 6,000. That's approaching too much laser power. You physically see the laser moving a crystal or blading a crystal completely, you're using way too much laser power. So there's always, there's too much laser power and there's too little, I'll show you both. So, let's work our way up. So we're at our spot. This machine's interesting, so you can select your range. So we're gonna do 700, like I was saying, for DHB, uh, up to 10,000, it's a good range. Automatic acquisition mode. Uh, I like automatic acquisition. If you were really crazy and you wanted to run it manually, you could, and then run it off the PlayStation controller here. I don't really wanna do that. Um, automatic mode, you just box a region, which looks like it contains crystals. DHB preferentially crystallizes around the edge. As anything's drying, you know, you know that things tend to dry at the edge. So your analyte is probably concentrated at the nucleation sites of your crystals around the edge. So focus your target and your shooting at the crystals around the edge. You can move around the plate by double clicking with the left click. Once it starts firing, you can see. Slow. Yeah. You know, I was telling you, these it's a pretty powerful laser. Uh, and it's a pretty strong potential, so it takes a while for it to charge it up. Ooh, All right, so you can see, it it physically firing the laser, right? Okay. There it goes. So, My goodness. As you can see, it's moving around. I got set up for the automatic me method to do a random walk at this speed for the stage. And so you can, uh, there's no really any reason to play around with that stuff. Um, but it's good to know. So we spotted a set of standards that go all the way out to 3,000. But you're only seeing standards that go up to about 2,000. So that means that you're just not quite using enough laser power. So this button will go up 100 laser power at a time, so let's go up 200 laser power and shoot another area. And you're like, oh man, that all of a sudden showed me some really high res data there, but it was kind of hot spotty. Some areas work, some areas didn't work. Okay, so you're approaching the right laser power, but you're not quite there yet. So let's go up another 200, okay. Let's go to another area where it looks like there's crystals. 
All right, so now it looks like it's uniformly kind of adding stuff in. All right, that's pretty good. Like in all malty, it's going to preferentially ionize small things over large things. It's not a very, it's not a quantitative instrument, and it has very, very poor linear range. You know, it's like if you're going to, its dynamic range is like a hundred, so it's just really not good. Uh, it, preferen it preferentially ionizes everything. So if too much of one thing there by 100x, that's all you're going to see. So uh, people are always fooling themselves if they spot a peptide sample and they spot it at high concentration. They spot it at high concentration, then it looks like it's really clean, but the, all the small impurities are 100x below, and so your dynamic range is really bad in this machine, so it looks really clean, but it's not really clean. So that's why I'm saying serious solutions, you want to spot the lowest possible concentration you can detect with the lowest ionization energy that you need. So you want to make sure you get, then I'll show you what it really looks like. Uh, let me show you that. I stopped resolution. You can check that it's a single charge state. So that right there. If we go into here, you can see I have my uh, calibration standards. So this is angiotensin 1, right? Uncalibrated. Even uncalibrated, this instrument is within one dollar, within a point one dollar. So it's you know pretty pretty sharp instrument. Um, so that's pretty nice. Since it's hot spotty, I always recommend people some data. So this is a, one accumulation. You want to hit the accumulate spectra, and that will add it into the sum. And then you can go ahead and cut, shoot a couple more times around the plate because it's, it's so differential. This ionization it kind of gives you a better better shot to accumulate a couple of them. You can double click to move around the target, left click, double click to move around. See? Super hot spotty moldy. Okay. So let's look at our largest peak. Right? So this is ACTH clip 7 through 38. You can see that it is isotopically resolved. Which is pretty good for a, for a peptide that big, right? Okay, so what happens if we put in too much laser powder? So let's go ahead, let's go up to like, you know, 5,700 laser powder. Moderately too high. Okay. Now you can see this a lot better, right? But you can notice that the peak shape is no longer sharp, and the isotope spacing is no longer going to baseline. So that broadness is caused by too much energy and charging on the plate and your molecule holding on just a little bit of that energy. So when the same molecule comes off and hits the detector, they're slightly off of each other when they accumulate and add in. And so that's actually giving you an artificial broadness on your peak. And so if you keep going to higher and higher laser powers, you'll realize that you're getting, actually you start getting worse and worse peak structure and worse and worse data. So you can get higher sensitivity because you're firing the laser harder and you can see slightly larger peaks, maybe? But really, if you look at the accumulated sum, all the peak heights are about the same. And so the only thing that adding increased laser power does for you is really drastically broadens out your isotope pattern. And so that's why you want to make sure you optimize your, your laser power for the minimum amount necessary um, so you don't have that charging effect. And that's actually way more important than you think because if you're going to do a digest, with peptide searching, you want to make sure that that mass is as accurate as possible across a range. Broadness will happen first for your large molecules, and it'll happen last for your small molecules. So what that will, what will do is your calibration curve will be really accurate at the low end, but it will be off by a lot probably at your high end. And they're way in amino acid by amino acid, shorter and shorter all the way to the center, right? So B and Y and I and right in the center would be left and right half.